Canada is completely unprepared for a major conflict like World War III. The Canadian military is in disarray and unable to properly defend the nation or support allies, even in smaller conflicts. According to an old saying, the mouse on the moose's antlers need not fear predators. This sums up Canada's post-Cold War stance. With oceans on both coasts, and being neighbors with America's mighty military, Canada has historically relied on geography and proximity for protection. With European allies admitting they dangerously neglected defense spending while depending too much on the US, Canada didn't even pretend otherwise. It's easy to dismiss defense when removed from potential conflicts while bordering the world's foremost military superpower. But the Ukraine war shows the US can no longer shoulder the full load. America's policy used to be maintaining forces for two major wars at once, but this is no longer true. While still formidable, even American power could be hard-pressed to focus on China while providing substantial forces elsewhere. This is where allies like Canada are supposed to help, but Canada is in no position to offer more than moral encouragement. At a recent NATO summit, Prime Minister Trudeau admitted Canada would never meet the 2% of GDP defense spending goal currently allocating only 1.29% of GDP. Polls after Russia's invasion found only 34% of Canadians support increased military spending. In the 2010s, the US revealed Canada was failing to meet NORAD commitments. Canadian jets had low readiness while facing personnel shortages. Most equipment was aging, with the bulk of air power over 40 years old. While Canada has since purchased new F-35 jets, delivery doesn't start until 2026. So what's wrong with Canada's military? There are several critical issues. First is a problem of culture. While Canada has made progressive reforms to appearance rules, Canadians themselves don't value their military. This feeds recruiting troubles. Canada's armed forces are understaffed by approximately 16%, meaning 16,000 empty positions out of 101,500 total. The shortage is concentrated in mid-level management like junior officers and veteran NCOs essential for unit operations and standards. Top-heavy hierarchies with inexperienced middle management cause dysfunction, as Russia demonstrates. Problematic military culture and frequent deployments contribute to the shortage. Many veterans, strained by constant family separations, don't re-enlist. With Middle East wars winding down, recruitment briefly outpaced separations. But COVID-19 derailed progress. In 2020, Canada enrolled only 2,000 personnel, half the target. 2021 improved to 4,800 recruits, but 6,000 are needed annually to fix shortfalls. Currently 1 in 10 military positions remain unfilled, exceeding the U.S. threshold for combat ineffectiveness. Two factors hinder recruiting. First, the Canadian military has a sexual assault epidemic, further tarnishing its image. Overall military culture is another obstacle, as Canadians are largely indifferent towards their armed forces, unlike American troop worship. This worsens recruiting woes and budget apathy. In the past, Canada's isolationism was justified, but no longer. America's closest allies took note, excluding Canada from the AUK-US Pacific Defense Pact against China, seeing Canada as inconsequential regionally. This snub was a wake-up call but military readiness continues deteriorating. Now, Canada still has some strengths like its renowned special forces supporting NATO operations worldwide. Canada has even led some multinational missions, proving it can orchestrate joint operations. But over-reliance on elite units strains them through constant deployments. The rest of Canada's military is under-equipped and understaffed. The Navy has 12 frigates as its main firepower, but they average 25 years old. Only 5 of 12 are seaworthy currently, with the rest undergoing maintenance. But even at full strength, the surface fleet is ineffective without US logistical support since Canada has just one naval replenishment ship, lacking defenses to survive hostile waters. Canada received increased spending for new equipment but lacks enough acquisition staff to execute purchases, with a 30% personnel shortage. Without sufficient procurement personnel, billions in funding goes unspent while old equipment is retained driving up maintenance costs. Donations of hardware to Ukraine, while admirable, are not being replaced due to procurement paralysis. This procurement personnel shortage stems from the recruiting crisis and unattractive military careers compared to the private sector. Canada has faced procurement staffing challenges since the 1990s, delaying modernization efforts. 
Stalled projects include new frigates, drones, and replacing donated equipment. What could Canada do in a major war like World War III? First, Canada must acknowledge it's vulnerable to global threats. Supply chain breakdowns from COVID should have been a wake-up call. A war over Taiwan would see China control advanced semiconductor manufacturing, creating severe access issues for Canadian technology. Russia's Arctic moves also threaten Canada's northern approaches. Melting ice will open new shipping lanes and untap fishing, oil and gas reserves. Russia is expanding northern forces, followed by expanded U.S.-Alaska defenses. But Canada is the real key player in the Arctic. Conflict over newly accessible resources would put Canada on the front lines. China's self-declared Arctic power status, despite no Arctic territory, signals their intentions in the region as well. Changing Canadian attitudes will be hard without a catalyzing event like Pearl Harbor. But Canada could still selectively strengthen defense within spending limits. Rather than mimic America's military, Canada should play to its strengths in supportive roles versus being an independent power. Cyber warfare is one niche where Canada could provide important capabilities on the cheap. Canada's technology workforce is growing faster than America's, and the country boasts top computer science and cybersecurity programs. Leveraging Canada's cybersecurity private sector expertise would be advantageous. Canada has already made big strides on cyber but government industry relationships need improvement for effective collaboration. Personnel and policy gaps also impede government cyber defense. Better coordination with Canada's elite cyber agency would help. Studying America's military industry partnerships could benefit Canada too. Another potential niche is resource security. Even with a mediocre military, Canada could serve as a stockpile of critical war materials for allies. Canada has the world's fourth largest oil reserves and is a top five global oil and natural gas producer. The capacity to fuel allies could be pivotal. Canada also has substantial rare earth mineral reserves, which will grow in importance if China's supply is lost. But Canada's ability or willingness to leverage these strengths is uncertain. When Europe sought alternatives to Russian energy after the Ukraine invasion, Canada declined requests to export more oil and gas. Canada also failed to increase oil production when asked. Canadian attitudes are partly to blame, but insufficient infrastructure is also a factor. Lacking liquefied natural gas export facilities on either coast, Canada can only export gas to the U.S. currently. Inadequate pipelines and oil platforms also limit how quickly Canada could ramp up production when urgently needed. If there is a bright spot, it's Canada's efforts around rare earth minerals to counter China's dominance. Canada is pursuing partnerships with the US, EU, and Japan to broaden rare earth production and supply chain security. Canada has also compelled Chinese firms to sell their stakes in Canadian rare earth mining companies. An initiative aims to boost domestic refining and output of these critical minerals. With an indifferent population resistant to military spending hikes, Canada's best role may be background support versus frontline fighter. Canada could contribute most by supplying and supporting allies versus trying to be a major military power itself. But even this modest support function seems a hard sell to Canadians benefiting from US military supremacy.